We are the United States of America. We are the greatest country in the world. We are the ones that can, can go anywhere in the world and save people. Make sure that they have diapers. Make sure that they have toothbrushes. Make sure that they're not laying around defecating in some silver paper. Come on, we're better than that. And I don't want us to lose sight of that. Strong words by late Congressman Elijah Cummings nearly three months before his death. At the time, Cummings was denouncing the conditions at the border and especially children being separated from their families. Cummings was chairman of the powerful House Oversight Committee and led the panel through some high-profile hearings, such as conditions at the border, disgraced Trump attorney Michael Cohen's testimony, the Mueller report, and the impeachment hearings. During the last weeks of his life, he battled health issues and sadly did not get the chance to finish the memoir he'd begun nearly a year before. That undertaking was left to his wife, Dr. Maya Rocky Moore Cummings and James Dale. They completed the book entitled, We Are Better Than This, My Fight for the Future of Our Democracy. Maya Rocky Moore Cummings joins me now from Baltimore. Maya, welcome. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. So, Maya, tell us, emotionally, how difficult was it for you to complete your husband's memoir? I mean, there were a lot of raw emotions. I just lost my husband, and I had to, of course, uh, read his words uh, in terms of his last message to not only me, but to the entire country. Uh, and so with that, you know, it was painful, uh, but his message to me was always finish what you started. And so I knew that he would want me to finish what he started. And your husband mentioned a few times his first meeting with President Trump shortly after the inauguration. He detailed the conversation about the proposal on prescription drug prices very clearly. But then the president's version of that meeting wasn't the same. Your husband said the president twisted his words. How did that set the tone for him going forward when dealing with the president? Elijah went into that meeting and he took the measure of the man. And the subsequent lies that the president told uh, were just, it soured Elijah on him as a person, as a human being. Uh, Elijah was always the kind of person that tried to find the upside in people. Uh, and he absolutely was not able to find it uh, in terms of his interaction with Donald Trump and certainly all the subsequent in investigations into the Trump administration's uh, dealings that Elijah had to actually, uh, you know, cover. Uh, and so with that, he was profoundly disappointed uh, in what he found in President Trump. And he spent the last year of his life working to warn the American people about what would happen if Trump got reelected. And your president also spoke about the friendships he had with some of the most staunch Republicans, despite not agreeing with their policies. We want to play for the viewers, you know, White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, who spoke about his unlikely friendship with your husband at his funeral. Let's listen. He's called a number of things, you know, father, husband, friend, chairman. Uh, for me, I was privileged enough to be able to call him a dear friend. Some have classified it as an unexpected friendship. But for those of us that know Elijah, it's not unexpected or surprising. Perhaps this place in this country would be better served with a few more unexpected friendships. I know I've been blessed by one. God bless you. So, Maya, how did he manage to forge such solid friendships with those across the aisle? 
So Where Better Than This actually talks about the value of actually seeing the human being and, uh, you know, working past policy and political differences to connect with people on a human level. And so Elijah connected with a lot of people, Republican, Independent, Democrat, uh, just on a human level. You know, who are you? Uh, and so, you know, with that, he had relationships with all kinds of Republican, Republicans like Mark Meadows, who is currently the president's chief of staff. Uh, unfortunately, he was not able to, to establish that kind of relationship with President Trump. Uh, hence, Elijah's warning to the American people that this man is not to be trusted with the future of our democracy. So this book is not just about politics. It's about life lessons, about how you can bridge differences in order to actually come to agreements. And, uh, you know, the fact that he had a long track, track record of working across the aisle and yet wasn't able to do so with President Trump was an indicator of what he uh, really firmly believed. And Maya, I want to turn to his health now because he never told anyone about his cancer diagnosis, even as he was battling it for 25 years. Do you think that that was one of the driving forces behind his you know, fight for health care for the American people? Yeah, so Elijah, the story of Elijah's family is one that is reflective of the health battles of the American people. His grandfather died uh, in the Jim Crow South, was denied the health care that he needed uh, by a systemically racist system uh, that wouldn't treat him the way that he needed to be treated. And then Elijah continued to see those patterns throughout the course of his life, both in his family, but certainly in the community that surrounded him in Baltimore City and across the country. And so his own personal challenge made him very sensitive to the needs of others. He knew that he was in a privileged position because he had a position that actually came with health care. But there were so many Americans that did not have access to health care or, you know, you know, drug trials at the NIH. And they were suffering, being crushed under the weight of very high prescription drug costs or a lack of access to quality health care. He wanted to use every means in his power to address that, whether that through be through the Affordable Care Act or through a deal with the president so that he could help the American people. And, you know, you mentioned a little bit of his family history. He was the son of sharecroppers, one of seven children, and often talked about the lessons his family taught him about determination and following through, as you mentioned at the beginning of our interview, and that if you are able to help, then you should help. How did he right. specifically use those lessons while serving in Congress? So there were a lot of lessons. Elijah would always talk about, you know, let's not just find common ground, let's rise to higher ground. Uh, and as a child, he was at 11, the age of 11, he actually uh, integrated a pool, a whites only pool in South Baltimore. Uh, and, you know, he, he figured out that he could leverage the law in order to help people who were actually marginalized or oppressed. And so you saw that same kind of fire in his belly, the urgency when it came to helping children who had been separated from their parents at the border or who were being kept in the cages, uh, when it came to you know people's health care access and all kinds of other issues. He was a champion for the underdog because he once was an underdog and saw the transformative power of how civil rights and fighting for human rights could actually uplift a nation. Yes. And the memoir of the book includes a foreword written by Nancy Pelosi. Can you tell us a little bit about their relationship? They were very close. Uh, Elijah considered Nancy Pelosi a mentor, and she was certainly his champion, uh, you know, certainly supporting his bid to be the chair or the ranking member of the House uh, Government Oversight and Reform Committee. Uh, she always took his counsel, and, uh, and he took hers. Uh, and so, you know, because they had a, a common roots uh, in Baltimore City, uh, they knew each other. They had this familiarity uh, and certainly uh, an understanding uh, that they were truly friends. And she was supportive of him throughout his career and certainly also in death. Um, she was a speaker at his funeral. Uh, and of course, uh, she was instrumental in naming the, uh, the House Oversight, Government and Oversight and Reform Committee room, hearing room, after Elijah. He became the first African American to ever have a room in the U.S. Capitol named after him because of her. Well, Maya Rocky Moore Cummings, thank you so much for joining us and telling us all about We're Better Than This. It sounds like it's a book filled with wisdom and insight. Can't wait to read it. Thank you so much.
Thanks for having me.